Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we meet again for our... Uh, actually, I was reminded today is not the fifth session, but uh, it's actually the sixth session. So we have gone through five sessions before. So this is the sixth session. And uh, tonight we will start discussing on the creation itself, right? Before this, previously we were talking about we were talking about uh, the creation myth of other civilizations vis-a-vis -vis with the Islamic uh, creation tradition, Islamic creation theory tradition, right? And we can see the resemblance or some similarities in between uh, those past civilizations. Uh, we call it past civilizations creation myth with the Islamic tradition, right? The story within the Islamic tradition, whether for the right or for wrong, we can, we will discuss later, but there are similarities. So it shows that in between civilizations, they were sharing of some narrations, uh, whether it, it pertains to the uh, creation theory itself or other things, right? So there was always the inter-civilizational sharing between past civilizations and also, of course, uh, across time and across space. Okay, so we were talking all that for the for the past five sessions. So tonight we'll start on the discussions proper on the creation theory itself, right? From the Islamic perspective, we're going to dissect the what they call it uh, the sources uh, that form those Islamic tradition or the tradition that I discussed with you uh, during the last session. Okay, so we're going to from tonight always going to investigate and dissect and we're going to look at it critically all those hadith or the Quranic verses or the interpretations of the scholars to those uh, Quranic verses and also to those uh, hadith right uh, that uh, form the basis of our Islamic uh, story or Islamic narration of cosmic creation so we're going to start inshallah with the creation of the metaphysical universe right Metaphysical means beyond this physical universe, something that we cannot see, the spiritual universe, some, some say the spiritual universe. Uh, you can say that if you want to, but it is the opposite of the physical universe. And the physical universe is the one that we can see, we can calculate, we can observe, right, from all the stars and whatever is up there and what is in front of us, those are the physical universe so metaphysical is opposite of the physical universe okay now uh before we go to start on the metaphysical universe let us have a very quick journey a very quick discussion right on uh what you call it as uh the current theories, scientific theories on cosmic creation. And right before we go to the metaphysical, let us have a very quick discussion on the creation of this physical universe itself and what are the scientists, what, what scientists say about this creation and the origin of the universe. Okay, now, in my book, chapter one, which is the discussion proper of the metaphysical universe, I start with the, the Quranic uh, verse in Surah Kaf, Surah Kafi, verse 51, Allah SWT says, Ma ashatuhum khalqa samawati wal ardi wala khalqa anfusihim. I did not make them witness of the creation of the heavens and the earth. I did not, Allah SWT says, I did not make them. Who are they? They of course, specifically refers to those uh, non-Muslims, right, who lived during the time of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But in general, right, we can say that them here also refers to humanity at large, humans at large, in general. So Allah subhanahu wa taala, right, tells us that Allah subhanahu wa taala does not make the observation of the creation itself, right, um, accessible to us. So we cannot see directly. We cannot see the creation of the universe and the creation of the earth directly. So we can only see indirectly. We can only infer right, to those creations from all the evidences, evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us. And those are the evidences 
that uh, ultimately form, right, uh, what do you call it as the basis of the current theory on what is actually, uh, no, how did the universe came about, all right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids us from seeing directly. Why? Because of the vastness of space and also the distance in time. Uh, we cannot look back in time because this creation happened in the past, way, way back in the past, billions of years in the past. So we cannot observe them. We can only see the evidences of those creation around us right now. Okay, so what are those evidences and what are those theories that the scientists proposed, the astronomers, the physicists proposed on how this universe came about? They were actually, or they are actually two major scientific theories, right, on how this universe come about. Now, the first one, right, is called as the steady state theory. And the second one is the Big Bang theory. Now, I'm sure most of us already heard the Big Bang Theory. There's even this television series or shows, uh, American TV series, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's entitled Big Bang Theory. So that, that shows how popular this theory is, Big Bang. But uh, I'm sure not many of us heard about the second theory, which is the steady state theory. And out of these two, actually, the steady state, the steady state theory is actually uh, the earlier theory proposed by two, so sorry, proposed by this English astronomer by the name of James Jeans. And then after that, revised by another English astronomer, Fred Hoyle. Now, uh, James Jeans not well, well known, but Fred Hoyle is one of the renowned astronomers. Uh, he, he died in 2001. So uh, these two, they proposed this theory. They call it a steady state theory. Now, what is steady state theory? Now, when they, you see, uh, one of the early uh, astronomers, one of the famous early astronomers in the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, his name is uh, uh, Edwin Hubble, right? Edwin Hubble. Now, Edwin Hubble is someone that is uh, quite well known uh, among the astronomy circles. He was the one who first proposed or no, not proposed. He was the first one who discovered that this universe that we are in right now, this vast universe is actually expanding, expanding. He found out when he looked up there with the uh, telescope, a special made telescope where they can look at the uh, spectrum of stars, right? And spectrum of galaxies, the light coming from the galaxy, coming through the telescope, and then after that broken up, broken down into spectrum, all the seven colors, and he can actually, he could actually see some lines, right? Uh, on that spectrum itself, this is quite technical. So whatever it is, he found out that almost all objects up there in the universe, they were actually running away from us they were actually accelerating or speeding away from us. So if, let's say, imagine we are at the center, right? And, and this uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, look up there. He saw that all the stars around, most of it, not all, 90%, 95% of all those stars and galaxies, they were actually accelerating or, or running away, speeding away from Earth. So he proposed that this universe is actually expanding. And if let's say we were to be transported to another star and we look back to our star sun, we can see the sun is actually running away from us. Much like you, need, you see if you have two cars, right? You are one on one car and another one of your friends another car. And you can see your friend inside the car, right? Moving away from you, right? Moving away from you. Now your friend, will see you also moving away from you, even though you're not moving. Even if you're not moving, because he is moving, and he can see actually you are as if you are moving away from him and he is not moving, right? If he's just focusing on you. So this is from perception. When we take a bus, right? When we travel or wherever, right? We are traveling forward, but we can see all those objects going backwards, right? Why? Because you are moving forward, so everything's moving backwards. 
we see the sun right moving from east to the west right the sun rises from the east and sets in the west because actually the earth is rotating from west to east is the opposite direction so if when the earth is rotating this way we can see the sun moving that way see so that is actually we call it every action as a reaction like some sort like that right so there's always the the what they call it uh, an opposite thing that we that we can see so if we are moving this way okay, we can see everything moving the other way so hubble when he look that the universe or sorry the stars and the galaxies almost all of them are moving away from us right at a great speed actually the only galaxy that's actually moving towards us is one of the our closest galaxy is called andromeda galaxy this andromeda galaxy is is actually moving towards our galaxy and it has been calculated that uh, in a few billion years in the future our galaxy which is called the milky way galaxy will actually collide with this andromeda galaxy and both of these galaxies are huge and uh, the andromeda andromeda Androm andromeda galaxy is almost the same size as our uh, what do you call it as our milky way galaxy so in a billion years in the future some billions in the future these two galaxies will collide each other this Andromeda galaxy is moving towards at a very, very great speed, almost like uh, like half speed of light or quarter speed of light. Imagine something moving very fast, almost like 10 to 20% of the speed of light. It means that it's moving at 3,000 kilometers in a second. So in two seconds, 6,000 kilometers. You see, and in one minute, 3,000 times 60 is going to be a hundred and no 1.8 million kilometers moving in just one minute so that's how the andromeda galaxy is approaching us but don't fear right it will not collide soon why because the distance between our galaxy and andromeda galaxy is two million light years away so this andromeda galaxy is two million light years away from us two million light years means that if you have if you have a laser and you point out to the, towards the Andromeda galaxy, the light from your laser will take 2 million years to travel across the vastness of space. And then after 2 million years of traveling, then it will reach, only then it will reach Andromeda galaxy. So that's how vast this universe is. So do not fear, it will not collide soon. Even if it's going to collide, there's not going to be a very huge explosion. No, don't think there's a huge explosion because these two galaxies, they have a lot of empty space in between. So, uh, I mean, uh, scientists and physicists and mathematicians, they have calculated that if these two, they are modeled, right, the collision between these two galaxies, if these two galaxies collide each other, they will actually merge into one big, huge galaxy. Right. So, but this, the point is that only Andromeda galaxy is approaching towards our galaxy, is approaching towards us. But other galaxies out there, they are all moving away from us. So Hubble said that the universe is actually expanding. And when other astronomers look at uh, uh, their telescopes and using the same technique, they found out the same, they, they reached to the same conclusion, they could see that the universe is actually expanding from us. So that is a theory. Right, the end, the universe is expanding. Now, how to explain the universe is expanding? What caused this universe to expand, running away from us? All these galaxies and stars running away from us. What caused them to run away from from each other? The first theory, right, uh, proposed was by James Jeans, and he said that according to him, and of course revised and supported by Fred Hoyle. According to him, the universe, this universe is eternal. Much like the philosophers in the past. Some philosophers like Ibn Rushd, Islamic Muslim philosopher, uh, and almost all Greek philosophers, right? They were of the opinion that this universe is as eternal as God. Of course, those no, who don't believe in God, never believe God, they never say it's, it's like eternal like God. But Ibn Rushd as a Muslim, right, and other philosophers, they were of the opinion because they were influenced by the Greek philosophers, they were of the opinion that this universe is actually eternal. This earth is eternal. It means that 
the this universe and this this earth both of them had no beginning much like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning these two objects has no beginning but that imam ghazali refuted he said that is actually a, a committing shirk because you are equating an object to be on equal foothold or equal level with god only god is eternal only god Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning and has no end. But if you say that this universe has no beginning and has no end, it means that this universe is on par with God and that is shirik. And so Imam Ghazali being a philosopher of himself and he actually learned philosophy to refute right, the philosophy of Ibn Rushd and he wrote the book Tahafud Al-Falasifah, The Incoherence of the Philosophers and referred to the philosophers who inadvertently without them realizing committed shirik. Right. So the theory, this thinking that this universe is actually eternal, right, has no beginning, found its root among modern astronomers in the early 20th century and among them James Jeans and also Fred Hoyle. So James Jeans proposed this theory. He said that according to him, this universe is actually eternal. It's already there. Right? It was there. Who created? No, there's no creation according to him. So in, in other words, he, James Jeans and other astronomers, they negated or they deny, they denied the existence of any entity that created this universe, be it God or, or, or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, this universe was not created. It was there all along. So that's how they want to make themselves uh, a denial of the existence of God. So they said this universe is eternal. Now, how to explain this expanding universe? So they said that, well, actually, you know, uh, space itself, right, started to expand because uh, things started to be created. Things being created continuously. The space in between stars actually contain things that we can't see and these things continuously being created and because they occupy space, so they push away all the objects in this universe. Of course, this is a very simplistic explanation. They came with all those, uh, what do you call it, uh, mathematical equations and whatever to satisfy uh, their, what do you call it, their theory, all right? So therefore, they say that this universe is actually expanding because there were uh, continuously, there are continuously matters being created to fill in the space. But then when they were challenged by other scientists, can you explain to us what are those matters that, that are being continuously created, right, to produce this, this universe that is expanding as what we can observe? He said, according to them, we cannot explain. There is no explanation that is satisfactory for all astronomers, right, to explain why this universe is expanding according to the steady state theory. So this called steady state is called steady state because, right, the universe is expanding steadily, right, and this state of expanding steadily continues it continues to the future, right? It happened in the past. When it started, this theory cannot explain, but it will continue to the future. When will it end? This theory cannot explain, right? So it can only, only explain the current situation of the universe. So therefore, astronomers, many astronomers, they were not satisfied with this theory because this theory cannot explain anything. You just come up with some thinking that, oh, there are matters being continuously uh, created to fill the void in space. But why is that? You cannot explain how long you cannot explain. What is the reason for that? You cannot explain. So therefore, your theory is not that good. So scientists came up with a second theory. Uh, this is the work of the scientists, right? They always try to find loopholes in other theories and they come up with their own theory. So the second theory actually proposed by this uh, Belgian um, astronomer, by the name of Georges Lemaitre, right? And he actually propose that this universe to, to explain that all the objects in this universe are spending from each other, right, to explain that according to him, 
all these objects actually started at one point way back in the past. We do not know when, right? Billions, maybe billions, millions. He could not explain, could not calculate it, right? So uh, he said this, this, all these objects, stars, galaxies, they were expanding. Now, if you reverse the time, there should come a time way back in the past where all these things actually originated from one point. Then from this one point, if you fast forward the time, everything will come out and fly away from that one point. So this one point is the, the point of origin. The point of origin of everything in the universe. Now, Fred Hoyle, because he was the proponent of steady, the steady state theory, when he heard about this theory by Georges, he said that, and he make a mockery of it, he said, what, you think that everything comes from one singular point and then there was this big bang and everything fly away, like an explosion, everything fly away. So this big bang that caused all the stars to run away. Then the astronomers that, that, that accept the theory of George, the history of everything starts from one origin, they said, yes, everything starts from one origin and then it flew away and we can see right the effects of them flying away right now from each other because they originally came from one point and that thing exploded or whatever but then because fred hoyle used the word big bang and this big bang is actually a nice simple word for people to remember and it actually reflects uh exactly the theory proposed by george lemaitre therefore these astronomers all the astronomers they took the name big bang and give it to their theory. Use it as the name for, for their theory. So the theory of Big Bang came about. The name Big Bang is actually right, proposed or given uh, in, in, mock, in mockery by Fred Hoyle because Fred Hoyle make fun of this theory. So he used the word Big Bang and then the Big Bang stuck. Just like, you know, uh, in Singapore, right, we use the word red dot. Now, people sometimes uh, I do not know, but I think many people, youngsters, they do not know where this the name red dot came about, right? Uh, actually, this red dot came about from uh, the uh, late Indonesian president, the second, no, sorry, the first president after Suharto. After Suharto came down, uh, then uh, uh, this president by the name of B.J. Habibi, Benjamin Habibi. Benjamin Yusuf Habibi. So the short form is BJ Habibi. He came and he took over temporarily the, the, uh, the president post of Indonesia. So he's, he was actually the third uh, president of Indonesia after Sukarno, Soharto, then BJ Habibi. So therefore, uh, during that time, I still remember in 1996, 1997, after Soharto was, uh, I mean, asked to resign, uh, 1998, if not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, after Suhatu was asked to resign because there were demonstrations in the road and so forth because of economic collapse and that, whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and Habibi looked at Singapore and Singapore is so prosperous and Singapore is so tiny, right? Prosperous and tiny. So he was telling his ministers, why are you so fearful of Singapore? Singapore is just a tiny island. It's just a red dot. It's a dot, a red dot, because color red, like angry like that. Singapore is like an angry, small child like that. So Singapore is just like a red dot. Now, then, then the name stuck. Singaporeans took it. Singapore government took it. Everyone took it, right? Even though it was, it was uttered in jest and mockery by the president. So you see, sometimes word that come out from other people in jest or in mockery, it's stuck because it is a beautiful name, right? Simple to remember. So the same goes with Big Bang. Big Bang was uh, the name uttered by Fred Hoyle right, in jest, in mockery of that theory, but the name stuck. So until now, people use the word Big Bang. But uh, when you say bang, it means that there is a sound. Right? There was no sound when this single explosion took place, the, the, the origin of everything took place, right? exploded. There was no sound because there was no air. Air was not created back then. right? And it was, if you want to call it big, yes, it can be big, but actually it's not big at all. It was very, very small, right? Everything came from a very, very tiny uh, volume of space, which incredibly, amazingly small. I will share with you later on how small it is when we talk about Big Bang in theory, also in detail, okay? 
So there was no big, there was no bang, but the name stuck because it, it conjures up that, that uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a vision that, that, that everything comes from a small point and then running away, uh, expanding away from each other. So between these two theories, steady state and Big Bang, of course, Big Bang theory is accepted by almost all astronomers to the point that now we hardly can find any serious astronomer that still believe in the steady state theory. Vast majority, I think we can safely say 99.9% .9 of astronomers and scientists, right? They actually follow the theory or they accept the theory, the Big Bang theory. Why? Because the evidences for this theory is overwhelming. There are overwhelming evidences that point out to the accuracy of this theory, Big Bang theory. Now, all these evidences, there are many, many evidences, right? All these evidences, actually, we can reduce it to just, we call it three major evidences. The other are all minor evidences. These three major evidences that cause many scientists, many uh, astronomers, physicists to accept the Big Bang theory. Now, number one is, of course, the expansion of the universe. Steady state theory tried to explain the expansion of the universe, but they could not. They were unable to come up with a reasonable explanation on why matters keep on being created in between the void of space to show that or uh, to, to cause all these stars and galaxies to expand to each other, right? But Big Bang theory, right? By virtue that everything comes from one origin, one singular origin, and after that there was a huge explosion, whatever it is, and then everything comes about flying. So that that reason for the expansion of the universe is more acceptable, more logical, right? And have more what you call it as uh, has more. Uh, logical explanation lah, if I want to use the word. Okay? So therefore, the expansion of the universe is actually one of the, or if I say not one, the biggest evidence for the, uh, what do you call it, accuracy of the Big Bang Theory. Now, number two, no, not just that, the Big Bang Theory, when the scientists, they calculated, they used this theory and they, they come up with all the equations and they actually predicted right uh the speed of expansion the velocity of expansion of all these galaxies and stars right uh and then after that those scientists other scientists they look up there they observe all this expansion of the stars and galaxies they found out that what what they observed actually was within the prediction of this theory all the mathematical equations right produced by this by this theory, Big Bang theory, actually uh, quite accurate when the scientists look up there and see for themselves right, the expansion of the universe. So the prediction of this Big Bang theory from all the calculations actually concur with observation. So therefore, they accept this Big Bang theory. So that is one major evidence. Second one is what is called a CMB. Right, cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay, so CMBR lah. Right, cosmic microwave background. Now, when you switch on a radio, right, in between uh, radio stations, whatever radio stations, right, in between them, when there's not, not no radio stations uh, broadcasting anything, you can hear hisses. Right, all these hisses. Now, where are these hisses come from? You can't say that, oh, it's just electronic inside the, the radio. No, 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 right? Because you see, radio has this, this what do you call it, antenna. And this antenna is actually capturing all those uh, radio waves from all over or from its surrounding. Now, these radio waves, if it comes from a nearby radio station that is broadcasting signals, radio signals, and that is releasing a strong, so therefore, this antenna capture that radio signals and therefore it translated into it will translate into sounds so you can hear sounds right we can hear people talking music or whatever but in between if there's no broadcast right in uh, from the antennas of, of broadcasting stations this antenna this radio antenna will capture the radio waves 
of other things. And mostly, this antenna, a simple radio with this antenna, will capture the radio waves of things that come from outer space. So all those hisses that we hear, right, when we open up, when we tune in radio and in between station, those radio hisses actually come up from other sources of, of radio waves and most of it come from outer space. How do you know it? Because scientists have calculated, right, uh, or they had they use experiment, wherever you pound, you, you, you uh, point your antenna, wherever in this world, whether you are north, south, east, west, or wherever in this world, you will find the same frequency of hisses and the same energy of those hisses. So these hisses that we hear radio, they're actually the same all over the world, right? In terms of intensity, energy, and frequency. So they found out not just one radio because back then they used a huge radio with a huge antenna. And they found all these hisses, right? And they found out everywhere, they found out this, this the huge antenna everywhere uh, up there in space, right? The sky there, they found out the same hisses. So the conclusion is that these hisses must come from the space up there, right? Not from uh, earthly sources. It must come from the extraterrestrial sources, those space up there. And then they calculated, they found that this hisses, right, carries the energy of about three degrees Kelvin. Now, Kelvin is a unit of temperature, if you're not aware of that, right? We have the Fahrenheit, we have Celsius, uh, but those Fahrenheit Celsius is not the scientific, or uh, do you call it as a standard, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, standard measuring, uh, forget the word, uh, measurement for for, uh, for measuring something, lah, right? We have like meter, kilometers, millimeter, those are the SI, they call it the standard uh, measuring instrument. Lah. Okay, uh, I'm not sure, I forget what it is. Lah. Uh, yeah, it can be unit, yes. Okay, so then, Therefore, it's three degrees Kelvin. Now, the difference between Kelvin and also Celsius is that uh, zero degree Celsius is 273 Kelvin. Zero degree Celsius is 273 Kelvin, not degrees Kelvin, no. You can see degrees, but we always use Kelvin. So, 273 Kelvin. It means that um, ice melts at zero degrees which also corresponds to 273 degrees Kelvin. Now, why 273 degrees Kelvin? Because if you go back, way back to zero Kelvin, right? Zero Kelvin is zero degrees Kelvin. Now. It's actually a theoretical limit of the coldest temperature that can be achieved in this universe. If you ask how cold, can something be the cold? What is the coldest temperature, right, for for an object that uh, an object can achieve in this universe? We say that it is theoretically, just theoretical, not practical, zero degrees Kelvin. But until now, people can cannot do experiment and reach to the zero degrees Kelvin. People can reach to zero point three degrees Kelvin, zero point one degrees Kelvin, but zero degrees Kelvin impossible because it's just in theory. It is uh, a state where all the movement of electrons and protons and neutrons inside the atom, they stop moving at all. So it, there, there will be zero movement in atoms. What is heat? Actually, heat is actually the movement of atoms, the vibration of, of electrons, protons, right? Especially electrons, right? Uh, and, the, and the movement of the the uh, the atom itself right that produce that is what we we perceive as heat so the more that they vibrate the more that they move the higher will be the heat the lesser that they move right the colder it will be for us right so zero degrees kelvin is when atom will stop moving at all we can't achieve that so it's theoretical limit so therefore they found out that out there right this 
cause uh, they call it as microwave or radio wave that that the radio antenna can capture it, it is at three degrees so that that how that is how cold right the universe is three degrees kelvin okay uh, you can't measure it using normal thermometer lah, of course now the interesting thing is that the interesting thing is that this three degrees kelvin actually has been predicted by the big bang theory before it was discovered by scientists so this big bang theory right among all these calculations and and, and equations they predicted that this universe produce radio waves at energy level of three degrees kelvin and when they look up there with their radio instrument they found out that exactly as what has been predicted by big bang theory the temperature the energy of this whole universe wherever it is is actually at three degrees in other words how cold is out there right in the universe it's outer space there how cold it is if it is within you know uh earth space or in between earth and 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 the, and the moon or within the solar system it might be around five degrees kelvin five to four degrees kelvin but if you move to the space in between galaxies where there are no stars the temperature can drop to three degrees kelvin right that is how cold it is the universe is three degrees kelvin so it's actually minus 270 degrees celsius 270 minus 270 degrees celsius that's how cold it is you know in, in on earth you can achieve the coldest temperature ever recorded on on earth right uh naturally is minus 50 degrees celsius many 50 many 60 degrees celsius uh, we industrial uh, production of of uh, nitrogen carbon dioxide oxygen uh, yeah they can achieve to about minus 100 degrees minus 180 degrees kelvin uh, sorry celsius right but to reach to minus 200 degrees 250 degrees is very very difficult right in lab yes they can produce uh, liquid even liquid helium liquid hydrogen and that is around uh, minus 269 minus 270 degrees celsius minus super cold super cold fluid that that being used to produce a super uh, conductor uh, that's another thing lah. so whatever it is right the second evidence for the for the existence of big bang theory the accuracy of big bang theory is the existence of this cosmic microwave background radiation which is the hisses that we hear right in between uh radio stations those come from outer space and it's at three degrees kelvin of course they won't call it as radio waves they call it as microwave because it is that cold right radio has some energy but if you reduce the wavelength to become micro it is becoming uh, i mean uh less energetic and so forth so they use the word cosmic microwave background now the third evidence is uh, the ratio between hydrogen, helium, and other elements in the universe. Do you know that the most abundant element right, in this universe is hydrogen? Because hydrogen is the simplest element. It just consists of one proton and one electron. Right? And second most abundant uh, element in this universe is helium. There's no oxygen. Oxygen and carbon, carbon, nitrogen, all these, all these elements in the periodic table, right? As you go down the periodic table, it gets lesser and lesser and rarer and rarer. Right? So the two most abundant element, elements in this universe, they are hydrogen and helium. But hydrogen is much, much more than helium. About three is close to one, something like that. Right? Three hydrogen uh, atom to one helium atom. That's the abundance of, of, of hydrogen and helium. And you look at the stars up there, right? The stars, how they shine, because they use, or inside the stars, there is nuclear reaction, nuclear, nuclear uh, fusion that fuse hydrogen together. So the stuff of the stars, right? Stars are made mostly by, from hydrogen. So, Hydrogen is the most abundant element in this universe. 
from hydrogen comes helium, from helium comes other elements, and it goes down the periodic table until you reach iron. And iron is the last stage of nuclear synthesis inside the stars. So when the stars exploded, right, and then the iron scattered over all across the space, and then this iron collected together and become planet, and that's why we have like for example, our planet Earth here, we have iron core and we have iron in abundance right on Earth's surface. Everything comes from the sun, right? And you look at the sun or whatever, you look at the stars, the size up there. So what we have, we see right now, the metals that we, we can produce actually come from stars up there, right? This is, it's being sent down to us. And interestingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this exactly and used the same exact word in a surah in Juz 27, the last surah in Juz 27, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aptly give, gives the name Al-Hadid, Surah Al-Hadid. Al-Hadid in Arabic means iron. And towards the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ and we send down iron. Allah used the word send down. Previous, you know, interpret, uh, uh, scholars, right? Uh, the scholars of Tafsir, because they, 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 they do not, they did not know about these modern uh, theories of, of, of pre, uh, I mean, uh, nuclear synthesis in the sun, right? They do not have that knowledge of, of uh, nuclear reaction, right? And atoms themselves. So they interpret the word anzalna means Khalaqna, we created. So they give information, we created iron. And this iron is of course strong. Right? Inside there are strength, great strength in iron, Allah SWT says. But Allah SWT never used the word anzalna, sorry, khalaqna, created. Allah SWT used the word anzalna, which literally means we send down. And right now with our current knowledge, right, with nuclear reaction inside the stars, we know actually, and all scientists agree, that the iron that we can see on Earth right now actually came from the space out there, right? From other stars. When the stars exploded, they scattered all those iron, and this iron gathered together to form planets. And one of those planets is our planet. So uh, actually, iron, right? If you look from that perspective, iron come from up there and is sent down by the gravitational pull of this proto planet. Uh, the early planet, and therefore the iron gathered and become the iron core of that planet. You see, Allah SWT says in Surah Hadith, way before people have discovered that iron actually comes from the stars. But whatever it is, coming back to this major evidence, why this ratio of hydrogen and helium and other elements in this universe is a major evidence for the accuracy of the Bang theory? Because before this ratio was discovered by scientists, the Big Bang Theory actually predicted that exact ratio, right? From all the equations, right? They come out that, okay, we predict that this universe from this theory states that there should be, should be so much hydrogen, so much helium, and so much other elements, okay? Just prediction. Then when they found out, they look up there, they discovered, scientists discovered that the ratio that this Big Bang Theory came about predicted was actually exactly what they observed up there. So all these three evidences show without the slightest doubt that Big Bang actually happened. It's not just a theory, it is actually a fact, right? Accepted by all uh, because of these three great uh, major evidences. Now, before we end, right, uh, tonight's session, I want to show you these pictures. This is a nutshell, a summary of a Big Bang, right? Now, Big Bang, right, if you look at this, this, this is not a visual cone of the creation of the uh, the universe. No, this is just uh, what they call it, somewhat like a figurative drawing, right? Uh, to piece in together time and also energy and the content or things, events that happen within that time and within that energy. So if you can look at up here, right? These are the, what do you call it, the scale for time. And you look, instead of we have the X and Y exist for the graph, now we have this beautiful, what do you call it, two exist. One is time, and one is the other one going down here is the temperature. 
and see they use Kelvin, K, Kelvin here, instead of degrees Celsius. So everything started with Big Bang, a singularity here up there, means something very small, singular. Then after that, in about 10 to minus 43 seconds, boom, you cannot, you cannot even imagine how short the time is. 10 minus 43 seconds. It means that if you have one second, right, you have to slice it down to 0 0.000000 followed by 42 zeros. And then after that one, 0 0.42 zeros, just say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 42 times and then one. That is how very, very close, very, very short span of time from this, the moment of Big Bang to 0 0.000000, one second. That is the point where the temperature right, calculated by the Big Bang theory, all right? All these are calculation, we cannot observe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid us from observing directly. It is just our inference, right? We can infer from our calculations and what we see up there. So the temperature according to that theory, Big Bang theory is that the temperature of the universe is 10 to the power of 32 degrees. Boom, another big figure. You cannot even imagine how, how high that temperature, how hot it is is beyond hotness. And people ask, is that the uh, temperature of hell? How on earth can we know, right? Because the temperature of hell is something that is secret. Only, only Allah SWT knows. Only we know that the temperature of hell is so high. But how high it is, how can we measure, right? Allah, Rasulullah SAW never tells us that the temperature of the hell is so much, so much Kelvin. Kelvin was not even born during that time. Celsius was not even born. Fahrenheit was not even, not Celsius lah. Fahrenheit was not even born during that time. How can, how can the Quran and Hadith come out with that temperature scale, right? So is that how hot is that the temperature of hell? Wallahu a'lam, we do not know. But it is very, very hot at 10 to the minus 43 seconds. The temperature is 10 to the power of 32 degrees. So it's followed by one, followed by 32 zeros, 32 zero, one zero, 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 zero. So a trillion, 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 trillion degrees, something like that, right? More than a trillion because one trillion, one million is six zeros. One billion is nine zeros, right? One trillion is 12 zeros, just 12 zeros. Now we have 32. So it is a trillion, 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 a little bit more billion degrees Celsius. Then at 10 minus 34 seconds, right, we have 10, uh, 10 to the power of 37. So the universe is getting uh, cooler, not colder, right? The temperature actually drops drastically from 10 minus 32 to 10 to 27. And then it continues at 10 to the minus 10 seconds, and then it drops to 10 to the power of 15 degrees, and so forth. So what are the events? What were the events that happened during this time? Of course, they were events, right? All these things, not just drawing. So they just, uh, all these drawings, they, they are descriptions of, or not just descriptions, they are just what you call it as, uh, uh, yeah, you can see descriptions or they can see uh, representations of things that happen, atoms, right? Subatomic particles, right? Uh, energy level. We're going to discuss this thing in proper when we talk about Big Bang in detail later on. So then after that, uh, at uh, one second, atoms will form, uh, not atoms, right? Uh, all these particles and then three minutes, uh, hydrogen atoms started to form and temperature of the universe dropped to 10 to the power of nine degrees. And uh, 300,000 years, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, right? Uh, the first complete atom will form. All these are nucleus, atom nucleus. The first complete atom was formed, hydrogen and then helium, and temperature dropped to 6,000 degrees, just 6,000 degrees. You know, it's just like the temperature of the surface of the sun. How hot is the sun? The surface temperature of the sun is around 6,600 degrees Celsius. How do we know? Of course, we don't put thermometer there, right? We can use other methods to measure the, the temperature of the surface of the sun. So it's about 6,000 degrees Celsius surface of the sun. It's not that, that hot. There are stars that are 40,000 degrees Celsius. That's how hot the stars, some of the stars are right now. So 6,000 degrees Celsius, 3,000 years ago. Then uh, the temperature, universal temperature, the space temperature kept on 
right, uh, decreasing to around 18 degrees. And that is actually temperature that we can survive. But that happened only after 1,000 million years. 1,000 million years after the Big Bang. So galaxies started to form, right? And then 50,000 million years ago, right? 50,000 million years ago, we have our galaxies and, and we have our solar system being formed and the temperature of the universe dropped to three degrees Kelvin and it remains around three degrees Kelvin until now. So you have this man here, right? It represents us human beings, right? We are thinking creatures. Uh, homo sapiens means homo, that is thinking. Sapiens means uh, thinking, have brains. We praise ourselves. So we happen and we appeared in this universe much, much, much later after the Big Bang. More than 15, thousand million years after the big bang so what is 15,000 million years you can translate it to around about 1.5 billion years right after the big bang uh, that's how when uh, solar system started to form but we appeared on this planet earth after about 14 point five to 15 billion, we're not sure, but around 14.5 to 15 billion years after the Big Bang. So when we are currently looking up there, when we look at the stars, the older stars, the further stars, we're looking back uh, across time, right? And therefore we look at the universe when it was 15 billion years ago, right? So therefore, right, uh, this universe, some scientists predicted to be uh, the age of this universe is around 15, 14 to 14.5 to 15 billion years old. Some scientists say that it's more, it can be 16 to 17 billion years old. We actually do not know, right? Uh, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, estimates there. But whatever it is, this universe is very, 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 very old, billions of years old. Our sun is just 4.5 billion years old. Our earth is around that, 4.5 billion years old. This is how, how old our earth is. Imagine 4.5 billion years. It's not 6,000 years, it's not 1,000 years. So people who think that the, fir the, the first prophet Nabi Adam was put on earth when earth was newly formed, that idea is actually wrong, totally wrong. Right? Because the, this earth has been in existence way, way before Nabi Adam was put on this earth. 4.5 billion years. We come to that when we talk about the creation of, of the earth itself. So this is a nutshell, the age of the universe and how the Big Bang Theory predicted everything. And it has been found that all those predictions, all those predictions without exception, all of them are correct according to observations. All right, so we're going to stop now. Alhamdulillah, we exceed the time. And uh, next week, we're going to continue with our discussion, not just the Big Bang. We're going to start with uh, the metaphysical universe. That's where we're going to leave the scientific world. We're going to go enter into the religious, our, our Islamic discussion, especially hadith, right? Especially on hadith. We're going to uh, look at the hadith that talks about the creation of the metaphysical universe. So that will be, inshallah, uh, next week. Okay, so uh, let's see whether there are, uh, I think there are questions. Let me see. Okay, there are no questions, alhamdulillah. Okay, so alhamdulillah, there are no questions. So if there are questions, uh, if you want to ask questions, there's no time to ask questions because it's already 9 o'clock. All right, so we're going to stop here. Alhamdulillah. We're going to meet again uh, next week and continue our journey with the creation of the metaphysical universe. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azim ali wa lakum li sayil muslimin wa muslimat wa al-mu'minin wa minat and we end with tasbih kafara and suratul asr. Subhanakullah bika shadu ala ila ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubi ilaik. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim wa al-asri inna al-insana la fi khusr ila alladhina aman wa amlu salihat wa tawaswa bil haqqi wa tawaswa bil sabr. Thank you and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.